Gore Field. You know that fat cat that's really not even that fat? He's about the same size as the other animals in the universe. The one that eats but never gets any bigger because cartoon logic? Yeah, that one! Well, guess what? They made a movie about him. Well, they already made two, but now there's another. No, no, it's okay. The big scary man is gone now. This one looks better. fart jokes and burp jokes. This time, they decided to go the fully animated route. Absolutely the right direction after those two lab experiments turned out like that. Yeah, I don't like the look of those two movies. Some people do. I don't. Honestly, I hate live-action movies like that based on animated properties. Maybe I'm just fatigued from how often Disney has been doing it, but I can't even remember a time in my life where I would have been super excited to see a live-action animated movie. But I guess I should go into how this thing was made. Well, after those two... Uh came out, Alkin Entertainment wanted to have a go at a Garfield movie. So, once the movie rights expired, they took him and brought on Mark Dindle to direct. His experience includes some animation work at Disney, mainly their older films, but he also directed Cats Don't Dance, The Emperor's New Groove, and Chicken Little. Alright, here's your gold star, buddy. You earned it. Also, Chicken Little and the Garfield movie both have the same Rotten Tomato score. One of these movies doesn't deserve that. I'm not gonna say which one just know it's one of them. Paul A. Nope, and Mark Even More Nope, and David Reynolds were brought on to write the screenplay. Couldn't find that much on the first two, but David Reynolds co-wrote the screenplay for Finding Nemo. I wasn't expecting that. And Jim Davis was involved as the executive producer. I'll talk more about that later. Chris Pratt was brought on to voice Garfield. Yes, Chris Pratt showing off his voice acting chops after his performance in the Mario movie. I actually didn't mind Pratt in the Mario movie. Sure, he sounded nothing like Mario, but after five minutes, I was completely used to it. But he learned from that movie and tried harder in this one, right? You know, to really understand everything, I'm gonna have to take you back to where it all began. Oh, look, use your normal voice for an animated character once, shame on you. Do it twice, it, it, still shame on you. Twice in a row, he doesn't even try to do any kind of interesting voice. Very flat performance, but I'll wait until the end of the movie to talk about him. And Samuel L. Jackson as Garfield's dad. Honestly, not a fan of celebrities replacing actual voice actors, but that's just how the world works now, and I like him. Good performance. Now, the animation is not as accurate to the comics as, say, the Garfield show, but that's probably for the best since that show looked kind of creepy. The Garfield movie was released on May 24th, 2024 and grossed $257 million against a $60 million budget. The critical response was pretty negative. I personally don't think Rotten Tomato scores are reflective of a movie's quality, but 36% isn't that great. I prefer the audience score slightly more though, and that has an 80%. Funny, the last animated movie Chris Pratt was in also had a lopsided critic and audience score. 5.7 on IMDb, lower than Despicable Me 4, this is why I hate movie review websites. Most Critics fought it strayed too far from Davis's original creation. Some also said the animation looked bad. One reviewer from The Guardian even went as far as to call it a foul feline origin tale littered with product placement. Oh, god damn. Me personally, I've watched it three times at this point. It's okay. But I like to wait until the end to share my thoughts, and we've already talked enough, so let's get into the Garfield movie. So the movie starts with, I've never heard of that studio before. Never heard of that one either. Or that one. Or that- Have any of these studios ever even made an animated movie before? Oh, Alkin Entertainment made one missed call. Great. Fantastic, even. And looking at the rest? Nope. What about Prime Focus? Literally couldn't even find them under that name, but I found D&EG Entertainment, so I'm assuming that's it? I don't know why the names are different, though. Looks like they've worked on some smaller films and projects, like Intergalactic and Nanoma, never seen or heard of those, so I don't know if they're good. But they also worked on Under the Boardwalk, well, okay, then forget everything I said, you get a pass. What about One Cool? They've made films such as... I don't think I like One Cool. Seems like mostly Japanese films. The most well-known one they've been involved in is probably Vivo. They're also working on the Angry Birds movie 3, so congratulations, One Cool. You're now on my top 10 what the f animation studios list. Finally, Wayfarer. Founded by Justin Baldoni, never heard of him. Couldn't find a ton of information about the animation branch of the company, but this appears to be their only animated film. Well, after learning all that, I think Garfield's totally in good hands. Anyways, the actual movie starts with Garfield ordering food, typical Garfield style. Stuff. We also get to meet Odie, and Odie sounds very weird to me throughout this movie. He sounds like he's voiced by a real person, because he is, but it's very obvious. Like, I don't know, I think they would have been better off just using stock dog sound effects. He takes us into a flashback where his dad leaves him in this crate. Oh yeah, I'm spoiling it now because it's super obvious. That's his dad. But he didn't raise Garfield to have a good attention span, which ends up coming back to bite him because Garfield smells and sees food and leaves. We're thrust into Mama Leone's Italian restaurant where John is eating and is all sad because he sees all these families having fun. Then John, why are you here? You gotta just stay at home and order out food. Nobody wants to see you here sulking, so just- What? 
Okay, sorry. John lets Garfield in and he violates the whole pizza, so John orders more food. But remember, Garfield and Patience don't go together at all, so he's already exploring the restaurant looking for more food. John goes on a wild goose chase trying to find him, eventually he finds him, he gets harassed by this lady who works there, that I get the vibe kinda wants to f*** him, and he leaves. He tries to leave Garfield, but after realizing he doesn't have a home, he chooses to adopt him. Wonderful backstory, then BOOM! We're thrust right into a title card, and a tie-in pop song with the movie, because that's the rite of passage in most movies nowadays. You can't call yourself a true Hollywood movie until you've wasted more of the budget than you'd like the public to know on an artist to write a song for you. Well, we hear this song, which is alright, I guess. I don't know, I'm not a song reviewer, I'm a... Wait. What? Am I? We see that John bought a new house, since his apartment didn't allow pets, and he also bought all this stuff for Garfield. How is he able to afford all this spontaneously? Don't worry about it, doesn't matter. What does is he also got a dog. We get a montage of the three of them just existing and doing stuff together, but then one night Garfield puts John to sleep, and that night, apparently everything was about to collapse. So John's fast asleep listening to this relaxing audio that wants him to imagine he's drifting away on a sea of tranquility. There are no pets to bother you, and companies don't put their logo on random things to take you out of a movie that's supposed to be in a fictional world. Anyways, Garfield and Odie get up for his midnight snack, and then these two dogs show up. I won't play it because I don't want to give anyone a seizure, but there's this annoying flashing lightning montage that lasts for about five seconds, and it's kind of random and annoying, and I don't really like it. They kidnap Garfield and Odie and take them to an abandoned mall, hang them up, but then this mysterious person shows up and rescues them. And it turns out to be his dad that abandoned him at the beginning? What? If you haven't noticed, this movie has been very very bold with its story choices so far, very much not doing things by the book at all. Vic, his dad's name is Vic by the way, wants to get out of there before she shows up. Who is she? Her. This is Jinx. She is definitely a very energetic character, and her voice actor definitely does a good job betraying that. She's just a little bit too over the top for me, but I'm sure she has her fans. She invites the three of them to sit down, and she explains that she came here looking to be a star at this feline talent contest. Now you're probably wondering, Zach, why do some animals in this universe get adopted by owners, but others are famous and independent? Don't worry about it, it doesn't matter, she fails and is all alone. That is until Vic and her crew take her in, and they're all a big happy family. Until one day, she got caught while they were stealing some milk, and now she's pissed at Vic since he never came back for her. Instead, she had to spend all that time in the pound until she met these two dogs, Roland and Nolan. They're like her henchmen in this movie, but I probably won't mention them again until the end, because that's when they actually contribute to the plot. They broke her out, and now she wants him to pay her a quart of milk for each day she was in the pound, which thanks to Odie, I found that is 1,675 quarts of milk. And Garfield and Odie have to tag along too. Why? Be because we need a movie. Come on, you should know this by now. Well, actually, she says it's it's because she enjoys seeing them suffer together. She also literally eats this bird that's been following her around, which honestly is probably my favorite part of the movie. I know there were kids probably asking their parents, Mommy, was the bird okay? Here, let me answer that for you. No, the bird never shows up again in the movie. He died. Probably a slow and painful death. <laughs> I love it when children get scarred. Garfield is pretty pissed he has to go, but Vic's excited and they go to jump a train. Oh, we also see John find out Garfield and Odie are gone. It's a running gag throughout the whole movie that he's stuck on hold with the pet finding place, so I'll just mention that here so I don't have to bring it up multiple times throughout the movie. Back to Garfield, they get on the train and he and Vic get into an argument over how terrible of a dad he is. Oh. My. God. Throughout this whole movie, Garfield won't shut up about how much he hates Vic and how awful he is for a band. Him. This might be fair for Garfield, but for we, the audience, we literally saw him for like six seconds at the beginning and that's it. Like, why should I be invested in the relationship when I don't even know how it was? Maybe have a little montage of Garfield and Vic play at the beginning and then have him abandon Garfield, that way we're more invested in their relationship? But no, instead Garfield just seems like he's overreacting throughout the whole movie. So they reach Lactose Farms, which is the place they originally stole the milk, but they've beefed up security since then. Now you're probably wondering again, Zach, how come in this earlier shot you can't see all these buildings in the background, but in this other one you can. Look, Chris Pratt raised his rates and we had to cut the budget somewhere. Luckily, that's when they run into Otto, one of the mascots for the farm. He used to live on the farm with his love interest, Ethel, until the corporation that moved in took him away from her. Why? Don't worry about it, it doesn't matter. Vic is able to convince Otto to help them in exchange for freeing Ethel, so he sets up this whole Mission Impossible style overview of the plan. The voice actor for Otto, Ving Rhames, actually was in the Mission Impossible movies, though I'll always know him as
as Cobra Bubbles from Lilo and Stitch. They go over the plan, but he's not convinced Vic and Garfield are prepared, so he puts them through this rigorous training exercise. They fail, so Odie ties them up to a tree until they learn to get along, which actually ends up working since Vic finally tells Garfield and the audience what happened that night. Turns out he left to get some fish out of the trash, but he got held up, and when he finally went back, Garfield was gone. Vic saw John had found him and decided to give him up to John, since he knew he would have a better life. Well, wow. how sad. If only the same misunderstood father-son relationship hadn't been done in a Billy and Jelly and other movies. Also, Otto says they're ready for the heist, since it would take too long to get them ready, yay. Then we get to see Jinx again. She calls up the dairy to tell them that there will be an attempt to rob them, because she didn't care about the milk in the end at all? What? The workers at the plant take this information to the security officer named Marge Malone. I like her, because she has a Karen voice. Let's go have a look see. It's the day of the heist, and the three of them successfully make it into the vents, but then they fall into the pine cone, which is an area Otto told them not to go into. Garfield gets taken into all this heavy machinery, eventually he and Odie both get trapped, but Vic saves them. They make it to the loading dock, but uh-oh, Margie's there! Well, no wonder she's so evil, her office is dark and full of monitors that emit red light, that would give me a shit ton of headaches, that place must be hell for her eyes. While Otto creates a distraction, Vic decides to push Garfield and Odie to take out Marge, and then he steals the truck and leaves them to fend for themselves? And when he gets to this road, Jinx is waiting for him? <laughs> what?! Apparently, like we saw earlier, it wasn't about the milk, it was about Vic's suffering, and since he got away unscathed, she has to find another way to make him pay. I remember I sighed so hard when I first saw this, this movie already feels twice as long as it is, you're telling me there's more? Garfield and Odie get taken to the pound, and when Garfield's complaining about Vic, all these other cats, who actually used to be a part of his gang, say that Vic would always leave Heist to go see his kid, and he would sit across the street on an oak tree and leave marks in the bark each time he visited. Oh, that's actually a little- Who cares? John's here! Everything's back to normal! baby, it would be kind of funny if the movie ended here, just with Vic dying. But nope, unfortunately movies have to be over an hour and a half at least, otherwise people don't call them movies, even though technically the threshold is only an hour. John's made a big feast for Garfield and Odie, but right as he's about to violate some more food, he notices the big oak tree across the street and goes over to see if Vic actually left marks in the bark. And it turns out he did, which means Vic didn't betray them, and he must have known Jinx wanted to do more with him, so that's why he left behind Garfield and Odie. But Zack, I hear you say, Vic has not been shown to be very observant, or even super smart throughout this movie, so it doesn't really fit his character that he would know that. So how did he know that? Don't worry about it, doesn't matter, he just knew, okay? So Garfield and Odie go to save him, and they leave John again. And the Garfield movie flexes its animation muscles by having John appear in the living room window when the cake explodes, but then the next shot, he's in the kitchen next to the fridge. By going to Jinx's hideout, they find out she's planning on throwing Vic off a bridge, so thank goodness they're able to get into contact with Otto, and he's willing to help them a second time. This movie's like 10 minutes longer than it needs to be, so I'm kinda just ready to finish it. Otto swings Garfield onto the train, he and Vic escape, then they get caught cornered, but Garfield orders a bunch of food, and he attacks them with it while Top Gun music plays, because anything goes at this point, and we needed to burn for some more cash. Once the three of them are taken out, Garfield and Vic go to the back of the train, the three villains somehow show back up, they jump off, but oh no, the net's too tight, and they bounce back up to them. Well... Looks like it's over, please be over, please be over, dang it! After seeing how nice their relationship is, Roland and Nolan don't feel like taking orders from Jinx anymore, so they let them go. And this pisses her the f*** off, so she knocks them all off the train, but she also gets knocked off. Thankfully, Otto is there to save all of them, and Jinx too, because this isn't 90s and 2000s Disney, villains dying in kids' movies isn't acceptable anymore, whether we like it or not. Garfield, Vic, and Odie give Margie the milk truck back, as well as Jinx, in exchange for Ethel, and she finally gets to reunite with Otto. Jeez, dude, you couldn't have at least clean yourself up before you met her again, you have leaves and sticks all over you. She doesn't seem to mind, though, because they have sex. Flash forward back to John's home, where Vic and Garfield part ways, but you know they're really not, so Garfield once again leaves John to go find him in the oak tree. And I don't really know if Vic moves in with them or just visits, and honestly, I don't really care. All that matters is they're a big, happy family, and wow, no shame, literally right there, huh? Well, that seems a little- Oh, come on, is this how you paid for Chris Pratt and Samuel L. Jackson? There was Olive Garden earlier, and hi- Heinz, the ketchup brand? Freaking Heinz in an animated movie about a fat tabby cat? Heinz? I just don't know about you anymore. So they're all good now. We also see Jinx doing community service. We also see Garfield's birthday and all the characters we've seen show up. You literally were too cheap to animate a clean model of him, weren't you? That's actually awful. We also get a normal cameo at the end to get all the diehard Garfield fans to be quiet for five seconds, and the end, finally. I do like the concept art we see in the credits, though, and that's neat. That's also a good question. I don't know why I'm... <sighs>
Remember when companies waited to see if a movie would do well before teasing a sequel? All this leads to is embarrassment if the movie underperforms. So, when I really... Well, what you really have to do is... One thing I... If I could just change... I just found it weird how... Lasagna. Honestly, it was okay. Literally just okay. This is probably the most meh movie I've seen in a while. Like, I'm not joking, it's actually just okay to me. I really don't have strong feelings for it either way. I'm not gonna hate on it too much, but you won't see me wearing this anytime soon. Seriously, smack in the middle. On the Zack Attacker movie raider, right in the middle. A perfect 5 out of 10. Did I enjoy watching it multiple times? No. Honestly, a high-stakes big adventure setting like this just doesn't fit Garfield too much, and that's something many critics noted. So honestly, this movie is flawed from the very beginning, no matter what it does, because you can't make an entertaining movie of a cat just sitting on the couch eating lasagna, but it also feels weird seeing him do all this crazy stuff. The plot really isn't that long when you think about it. Garfield just meets his father, and they have to break into a dairy farm to get milk to repay Jinx. That's it. Now, an issue I had with this movie all three times I watched it was that it just feels too long. Like, seriously, when Vic escapes the dairy in the truck and Jinx stops him, it feels like the movie should end around there, but nope, instead it keeps going for like another half hour. It's paced kind of weird, there's not a whole lot of flow, stuff just randomly happens. We go from Quiet Garfield at the beginning, to they're kidnapped, to now he has to go on an adventure with his dad, to then they made a random bull who has to help them into the farm, but then that plot gets dropped in favor of Garfield going to save his dad from a moving train, like, stop going all over the place, movie. You're not a YouTube shorts creator. Jinx was an alright villain. Like I said earlier, a little over the top for me, and her motivations were a bit weird. She never cared about the milk, she just wanted Vic to suffer, so that makes all the stuff involving the dairy heist completely useless, and it's not a very satisfying watch because of it. Like, just fast forward for all the dairy stuff. It literally does nothing except put Garfield and Odie in the pound, but then they immediately get out. Not much to say about Odie. He never talked, and I already mentioned his barking earlier. Otto was alright. I liked him good enough, I guess. Yeah. Also, let's talk about Vic. He was a fine enough character, but he and Garfield's relationship, as I explained earlier, was very much not handled correctly. We don't get the chance to learn who he is or anything, just boom, immediately gone. They should have done what I suggested, which is have a short little montage of he and Garfield having fun and hanging out together before he abandons him. That would have made it more saddening when he left, and we could understand Garfield's rage throughout the movie a lot better. But no, we know nothing about their relationship. Garfield doesn't even seem that sad when he leaves the alley or when John takes him home, so we're left to think neither of them even care care about each other. Also, if Vic truly did love Garfield, why didn't he just show up to John's house? They try to explain this in the movie by saying he didn't want to ruin Garfield's life with John, but how would that be ruining it? John probably would have let you move in, since he literally did at the end of the film. Voice acting, Chris Pratt, honestly kind of a flat, unenthusiastic performance, just like the Mario movie. He didn't even try to sound like Garfield. Like, his voice actor in the f***ing Garfield show sounds much closer to what I imagined Garfield sounding like. And it's not like all of his performances are awful, the main problem is that he's playing characters that already have predefined voices. Like him playing Emmett in the Lego movie. Doesn't bother me, because he's an original character, so we don't have a baseline of what he should sound like. But with Mario, we're so accustomed to seeing him with an Italian accent that you bring someone like Chris Pratt with such a flat, deep voice, it just doesn't seem right. And Garfield has had lots of voice actors over the years, but I think the one in the Garfield show is my favorite. That just seems like what Garfield would sound like to me. John ordered that pizza almost 12 minutes ago. <sighs> it's too late for me. I'm famished. <laughs> Like, in that show, even without seeing it, you can just listen to it and go, Alright, yeah, that sounds like a fat cat who's indifferent towards life. But in this movie, it's like, no, you listen to it without seeing it, and he looks like he could be a f***ing supermodel. Samuel L. Jackson as Vic was much better for me, though. A very natural-sounding performance. Jinx's actor stole the show, though. Hannah Waddington voiced her. I had never heard of her before this, but she did really good. Very energetic performance. Definitely made Jinx a pretty memorable character, even though I wish she was toned down a bit. Ving Rhames as Otto was good. John's voice actor was good, Roland and Nolan's voice actors were good, I liked Marge's voice actor too, very fun performance. But overall, I just have to ask, did the team even care about this movie? Like seriously, when a team that works on a movie cares, you can tell. The animation looks fine enough, but there's lots of inconsistencies, and it just overall looks pretty flat and boring. They definitely play it safe. Looking at behind-the-scenes footage- oh wait, there's barely any. There's like two little featurettes on the Blu-ray, and they're the most play-it-safe PR machine interviews ever. Oh, I played Blank, who is a character that goes through a lot of change in the movie, and I had a lot of fun voicing them, and I definitely relate to them. 
Cool, give me more. Show me the animation process, the writing process, storyboarding, give me commentary with the director, something of substance. It's got Jim Davis's approval though. I love how with a lot of these older creations, people complain that, oh, they're not as good as they used to be and the original creator would despise these. Modern Simpsons sucks. Matt Groening would be ashamed at what it's become. And Jim Davis would puke if he saw this. Chris really understood the character and absolutely nailed him. You can sit back immediately and go, yeah, that's Garfield. Well, it's gotta be AI. I think the truth is that these original creators of these beloved shows and characters either don't care anymore and they have moved on. Like, sure, make a Garfield movie. Just stop flooding my f***ing inbox with emails, please. Or they just have different ideas and opinions and what makes their creation good. Maybe Jim Davis didn't care about this movie and he just went on because he was bored. Or maybe we're the picky ones and he's just more open to new ideas to do with his now 46-year-old creation. It is good to keep things fresh. And you also gotta remember, he didn't make this. That doesn't mean he doesn't like it, but he doesn't even own the Garfield rights anymore, so I doubt he was consulted too much on this. I guarantee the executive producer role is more ceremonious than anything. But besides all that, I can't think of much to say. Like I said, right in the middle for me. Wasn't good enough for me to like it, wasn't bad enough for me to despise it. I still don't like it, and I don't want to watch it again, but I don't hate it with every fiber of my being, like some people do. I think some critics were a bit too harsh, though that's true on most movies. I'm pretty happy with the rating I gave it. And remember. And as always, I encourage you to go watch the movie yourself if you haven't already seen it, since I cut out well over half the content in it to condense it into this 15 to 20 minute episode. There might be things in it you like that I missed, or scenes you find funny I cut out. And considering how much of the animation industry Chris Pratt is slowly but surely taking over, I'm kind of concerned about who he's going to voice next, right Yoshi? You know, to really understand everything, I'm going to have to take you back to where it oh. all began.